So good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for Black Life, a Toronto teach-in on Black Studies, Literature, Visual Arts, and Disability Studies that's hosted by the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. I am Andrea Davis. I'm an Associate Professor of Black Cultures of the Americas in the Department of Humanities at York. And I also am serving this year as special advisor to the Faculty of Liberal Arts on Anti-Black Racism Strategies. Before we get started, I just want to um, orient you to some instructions for today. Um, your videos have been turned off. If they haven't been, we're asking that you do turn them on. We're expecting a very large audience and uh, um, having the videos off will help ensure that we have a smooth, um, we have smooth technical services. Um, you should all be muted as well and will be muted throughout. To submit questions during the Q&A period, we're asking that you write your questions in the chat feature and direct them <clears throat> to the, the host and we will try to get to as many of them as we as we can. We've also arranged to have live captioning for this meeting. Um, thank you, Angie Lang, for providing this for us at very short notice. Any participants who would benefit from captioning are encouraged um, to use the instructions on on the screen to bring their to bring your mouse to the bottom of the screen and select the closed captioning option, the text will automatically appear on your screen. I would like to, before we begin or, or go further, to acknowledge that this teach-in is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same area. I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As members of the York University community, we recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As a descendant of Africans formerly enslaved in the Americas, who were taken from their ancestral lands against their will, I am committed to a notion of mutual care in my scholarship and in my teaching and recognize that a future for Black peoples is not possible without a future for Indigenous peoples who have lived in these territories for many thousands of years and by whose leave I humbly walk on and share this land. Thank you so much. This, this teach-in today um, brings together um, six wonderful speakers. Um, is it five or six? Five, sorry, five wonderful speakers um, who, who come to us from different, different areas, different disciplines, different perspectives from the arts, from diaspora studies, black studies more generally, and also from the social sciences and health studies. And I want to thank them for their generosity in, in accepting this invitation and for joining us today. 
I wanted this teaching to help us think beyond what has been a narrative of so much death and so much trauma, not to move beyond it in the sense that, that it is not there, but to help us think about the ways in which Black life exists alongside and, and beside and in spite of trauma and the ways in which different disciplines um, can help us and the arts in particular can help us do those do that kind of work in ways that are that are surprisingly for me um, not surprising but in ways that are enriching and generative of of new thought and new ideas and so we are gathered here together to to share in what i know will be an incredibly um, fruitful conversation. I want to thank the Dean, um, Dean J.J. McMurtry of the Faculty of Liberal Arts for, for making this possible, for giving me the, the, the ability to, to do some of the things that, that will, will enrich um, the conversations taking place right now. Um, so I'm, I'm appreciative of that opportunity and I will ask him to give remarks in a few minutes. I want to thank our speakers, Christina, my colleague in humanities, Rinaldo, my very dear and long friend, so is Idil Abdilahi, Andrea Fatina, um, whose work is deeply respected by me and many others, and Kinesia Lubrin. I will uh, introduce them all um, in with more care in, in a moment. I also want to thank the technical staff. So Emily Blythe, George Ververidis, Catherine um, Skeen, Sasha Smith, Nazrin Vakulova for their help in, in organizing this with me. Romelia Williams also um, in my office and Deborah Bisram in the Dean's office. Thank you so much. Dean Matt Murtry, if I may, I would now like to call on you just to give some brief opening remarks. Thank you so much, Andrea, and you've taken away some of uh, my, my comments, which is wonderful. But I want to start by saying there are six wonderful speakers here, including yourself, and I really want to thank you uh, for taking on the role of Special Advisor on Anti-Black Racism for the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. And I wanna thank everybody that's here as well, not just the speakers, all of the people who have taken the time out of their days to attend uh, this inaugural and, and wonderful event. So thank you so much. I just wanna say a few words uh, because the words of the speakers are far more important, but I do want to highlight the fact that this teaching brings scholars and artists from York University, the University of Toronto, Ryerson University and OCAD University together, which I think is a really wonderful coming together to have this conversation uh, together and with our, with our community. And I'm so proud that Andrea and the faculty have been able to facilitate that conversation. I do also want to welcome deeply and thank our speakers, uh, Ronaldo Walcott, Adil Abdelihi, uh, Andrea Fatona, and Cassina Lubrin, and also a special welcome to Professor Christina Sharp, who is our tier one nominee uh, for a CRC in Black Studies. It's wonderful to see her again. So last spring, uh, Liberal Arts and Professional Studies made a commitment to respond to and combat anti-Black racism. And as part of that uh, and an ongoing strategy, we've engaged Andrea Davis uh, as our special advisor for the year. And again, we are so thankful that she has agreed. She brings to us a wealth of experience and scholarship for this critical position, and most importantly, leadership of which this event is a prime example of. This teach-in is an opportunity to engage in conversations uh, about Black life in Canada, to examine existing conditions, opportunities, and successes. And as Andrea said, to have a sort of a different kind of conversation um, than we have had over the past few months looking forward. It's Andrea's first event uh, developed and hosted by her. Uh, as our special advisor, and I know that it will be the first of many. We are planning a rollout of a number of different uh, actions, activities, and events, and so I ask you all to look forward to those and to please join us again. Because as a faculty, we are deeply committed to supporting this work 
and to rooting our practices in anti-racism and inclusivity for faculty, students, and staff, and to sp start conversations about the structural ways in which institutions such as universities have structural uh, racism and historical problems that we want to address, but also opportunities to move the conversation in our society forward. I really look forward to today's discussion and hope that it's the beginning of many more opportunities, as I said before, for us all to work together to make real and sustained change. I wanna thank you again, Andrea, thank you speakers and all those in attendance, and of course the staff who have made this event happen. And I really look forward to the conversation that is about to begin. Thank you. Thank you so much, JJ. So I'm going to now introduce the speakers, I'll, I'll introduce each as, as they are about to, to speak. And each speaker will have about 15 minutes, and then we will have um, some time at the end for, for a Q&A. Kinesia Lubrin is our first presenter today. She is one of Canada's brightest and most exciting poets. Her debut poetry collection, Voodoo Hypothesis, published in 2017, has been described as a subversion of the imperial construct of blackness and a rejection of the contemporary and historical systems that paint black people as inferior through constant parallel representations of evil and savagery. The collection was nominated for the Gerald Lampert Award the Pat Lothar Award, and was a finalist for the Raymond Selster Award. Voodoo Hypothesis was also named one of 2017's best books in Canadian poetry by CBC Books and one of the 10 must-read books of 2017 by the League of Canadian Poets. In 2020, Lubrin published a new collection, The Disgraphist. She she was also the 2019 Writer in Residence at Queen's University and is a lecturer in the Creative Writing School of Continuing Studies at the University of Toronto. And I should also say that she is an alumna of York University. Kanisa, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrea, uh, for making this uh, space and bringing us all into conversation. Uh, thank you everyone behind the scenes. Um, and of course my co-conspirators today. Uh, no surprise that the poet is here with poetry. I will read 53 Acts of Living. Zero. Hello. One. Are you cut? Two, does your blood collect into cotton, now set for the dump? Three, welcome. We have waited for you. Four, the ground has long entertained your mighty boots, your long and occasionally careful stepping. Why else would you taunt the earth to quake? How else to make plain that we are lambent on the ground? Five, as island of the edge of a continent, as island of the edge of islands, an island is always sinking somewhere. All of the sunken islands fold in a long braid in any direction, where north ends, where south opens, where east breaks from a peninsula where West punctures the view with sunset. A poet gathers all the living things, plus their shadows and how they fail. The poet fills boats upon boats with what remains and offers them the sea. Perfection is no prerequisite for revolution or inscription for that matter. Inscribed things need language, need the hard tuning of what living arches into dust. Even in history, what else is there but wonder? Six, the impossible thing about being in crisis 
is how one is thrust into maneuvers of survival. And at this axis, at first, the body must give up living before one knows the price of relief. Seven, one must give up on living. Eight, you in your body must stop the haptic responses a body makes to the commands of living. With any luck, you must. Nine, one must stop the act of living and conspire with being alive. 10, you must find the brute strength of an impossible language. Find a tone with which to communicate to yourself that all you must do, the only thing you must do now is make it past this or that critical second. 11, you slip through thin ice, for example, and your body must disobey gravity push your full weight against the tragedy of a descent back into the air. 12. Above the ice, you crush your thumb with a pestle, for example, and your lungs enlarge, invite more oxygen into the blood, and you curse the very idea of unflawed government. 13. You give your hand to cold water. 14. The reprieve distresses, excites the stock exchange. With any luck, you have died, and you know it. 15. You are locked indoors as COVID-19, a microorganism, ravages the world beyond your doors. 16. You know you can bring this devastation into your home, if you have a house, or else you walk with it everywhere wherever home is available to you. It is gradual, unlike endpoints, unlike motion sickness. Even when your repose exists only as psychic location or euphoric meditation, and you house your wisdoms in a tent in a city park, our triglodytic leaders make laws against any measure you use to reach for rest. In any case, everyone you know is exposed some more than others. That is the impossible measure we know. 17. Everyone you love is not loved any less, but all exposed and dying differently and alone. Maybe. Something startles us into recognition that everyone is dying from the day life begins. And so dying is no useful interdiction, but it is the reason most easily prized as rejection over rules. 18. My history, your place in it, is every occasion to feel a desert leap from hour to hour in our head. 19. Worry is this heavy, this hot, this frigid. 20. Worry is this master narrative. Worry damns us to treading this unliving which began centuries before our birth. 21. Christina Sharp says the weather, the climate, the wake. Rinaldo Walcott says the long emancipation. Idul Abdillahi says black life. Audre Lorde says poetry is not a luxury. Sidiya Hartman says lose your mother. Kiguro Macharya says, how will you imagine freedom today? Follow the eros. Franz Fanon says, the wretched of the earth. Dion Brand says, a map to the door of no return. C.L.R. James says, beyond a boundary. Octavia Butler says, parable of the sower. Samuel Selvon says, a brighter sun. Toni Morrison says, beloved. Austin Clark says, more. Derek Walcott says what the twilight says. M. Norbesi Billet says defend the dead. W. B. W. E. B. Du Bois says the souls of black folks. Linton Quezzy Johnson says England is a bitch. All the others say what all the others say. 22. You're looking out from here and maybe wondering what is next. How can you begin again? All I know is if my pen hovers over the page long enough because I am listening to the world. 
hearing what is revealed, what is felt and held because I am still here, because I am traveling the hard edged roads and meanings of this place. Things will eventually announce themselves. In all that living, there is war, there is madness, there is music. In that music, I find poetry. Whether or not I write it down is, of course, a matter of choice. If I write it down, be sure that I make something of silence. 23. The masses say in the streets, abolish, abolish, abolish. They say Black Lives Matter against the panicked seams of a globe long eventide coming apart. Everywhere, everywhere around, something blossoms. 24. Against this, capitalism, all the carceral cannons holding it up, more discontents toward anew. 25. All command is fury. 26. The willing good redeem little when the uncaring others offer nothing but the vast collapse of any usefulness toward the good. 27. Of things like power, violent supplements, anxious connections, imagination is not rock shun. 28. The point is you lose. You lose an understandable aliveness. 29. What you notice is not understood, nor is it living. What you gain is awe, and maybe you curse the frozen streams and lakes and sunlight that play between two deadly worlds. 30. The world you love and the world you know. 31. The body or whatever that, it has, that has had to give up, however momentarily, the fact of living in order to enact the will to survive is hardly aware that things arrive by departure. 32. Give yourself a chance to abide the indescribable. 33. Resist the ease that counts all of this as flaw. 34. This is how I was. Above the azure veins of the land and the sea, realizing everything could change. Even the aircraft seat beneath me. Above still, I saw the entanglements of frozen streams and lakes and sunlight in the urgent world, translating my maddened breathing, 75,000 feet above those fed up on the ground. 35. I say nothing, of course, but my mind is full of words assembling against ruin. 36. This was early March, and now it is July as I write this. 37. Often you will miss the needed shock and talent of that immediate refusal to continue or to find a way beyond the exhaust of work, as I do, and I do. 38. I exist, too, in the friction of misunderstanding. 39. I can do little else than take to the book I have not yet written. The revered networks to which ink infrequently adheres, like a fly buzzing away its tether to warm rice. Not that you think you're a fly. A fly is hardly committed the ways we're used to. You're just sitting in the sun asking a fly why calm is so impossible in its presence. The fly is unconcerned with what annoys me or with testing the limits of my patience with needle and thread or with ink, nor for the sake of bread. 40. After the event of waking up one day this spring and weeping for no single reason, I tally my being in the morning. 41. But I promise ice cream to a friend so we can think of when we can go outside again. 42. We are not the same. We are not in the same manner as we left each other before this pandemic shut our doors, shut us into the corridors of our lives, the ruination we would rather not see, the cell phone apps where we cuss loudly at each other's arrogance, where one of us sees the long haul of a world thick without the vaccine it needs, where the other sees the hysteria at hearing the real threat. We are both wrong, of course. We were both not wrong where we began. Only now we are. We both own the fact of hurt in that exchange. 43. After months, the flickering bulb of my screen over the date stamp of our last messages gathers dust. 44. 
after funerals attended on screen 45, after graduations attended on video 46, after birthdays attended on screen 47, after mourning, even mourning on screen 48, as my mother thins and thins and laughs still and asks for pizza for the first time in 50 moons, do I make it by hand? I make it flower by flower by cheese of vegetables, welcome the sightless work of heat and stone. Well done. 49. After gardens planted have bloomed and we eat, I will write something funny, I promise, but not today. 50. Through revolutions and uprisings and remembering the radio of my childhood as oddly intimate, I realized it was one way to lodge the voice against everything undone. Even their chaotic images crowding my palm as you speak into the telephone and my teeth make more noise than I intend. 51. Deathbeds are no silence, no place for talk of death. 52. Listen, I do not think language must ceaselessly serve us, but I look for reprieve everywhere around. Every book on my shelves, a zeitgeist alone a zeitgeist together. And as I think this, you send me a note, just as I jump and you gather me up. 53. The real phenomenon of loss is both the inventory of what no longer exists and the impossible measure of what survives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kinesia, for sharing those 53 acts of living. I'm now going to invite Andrea Fatina. Andrea Fatina is Associate Professor and Director of the Criticism and Curatorial Practice Graduate Program at the Ontario College of Art and Design University. She's concerned with issues of equity within the arts and the pedagogical possibilities of art works produced by Black Canadians in articulating broader perspectives of Canadian identities. Her broader interest is in the ways in which art, culture, and education can be employed to illuminate complex issues that pertain to social justice, citizenship, belonging, and nationhood. She has curated numerous exhibitions and is the recipient of a number of awards. She's currently working on the State of Blackness database project, a searchable web-based annotated catalog of works produced by and about Black Canadian artists, critics, and curators. Andrea, welcome. Thank you very much, Andrea. I'd also like to thank um, you for the framing of this panel around uh, the livingness of Black folks. I think, you know, this idea of this notion and putting forward the fact that we're here as Ronaldo and um, many other scholars and activists have um, talked about that we've, we're here, we have been here, and we will continue to be here is really quite refreshing for me as we talk about who we are, particularly in this moment, that seems, that is really circumscribed by trauma, death, black death. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd also like to say that it's quite wonderful to be in conversation with uh, colleagues, scholars, and friends um, who really shape my work and who we've been in conversation for a very long time. We need more of this type of inter-institutional engagement and uh, interdisciplinary engagement because I believe we're all involved in the very same project of our liberation. So thank you for organizing this. I'd like to like locate myself as to who I am and then what I'd like to do is to talk to you about my project called the State of Blackness, the research project, and to talk to you about a resource being the website and um, the subsequent projects that follow from this website project. So I am the descendant of um, the Yoruba, the Yoruba people from Nigeria, 
as well as uh, from uh, my mother's from Jamaica. I describe myself really as a stolen person on stolen land. I was born in the West Midlands in the early 60s and moved to Canada um, as a teenager. Much of my work, I'm going to share my screen actually with you all now. Much of my work is very much concerned with the redistribution of um, resources in relation to just making sure that the screen is shared. I hope you can all see the website, The State of Blackness from Production to Presentation. Much of my work is concerned with the, in, with the invisibility of Black Canadian artists within the culture sphere of Canada and uh, really trying to provide those spaces in which we, I respond to what I call not only the invisibility but the singularity of narratives that shape how we are presented within these cultural, within these cultural institutions and spaces that we exist within. The work also pushes against um, a number of ideological framings that have led to particular formations of policy in this country that excluded both indigenous, black and other racialized uh, folks in the country. Two policies in, in particular have um, really shaped the way I think through our marginalization. The first one being those uh, ideological framing that came out of the Massey Levesque Commission that led to the formation of the Canada Council for the Arts that actually centered English and, and Frank, Anglophone and Francophone cultural producers as the producers of art in this country to the exclusion of racialized bodies and Indigenous bodies. The second um, legislation that also shapes our participation in the cultural sphere, but not only the cultural sphere, I would say in all spheres of, of, of participation in this country is the Multicultural Act of the uh, late 80s. That in a way I, I say, and many scholars in this country say, really led to a dampening of um, indigenous cults for sovereignties and parse this out to the margins of who belongs to this country and which bodies actually uh, produce art in the country. So this state of production, the state of blackness from production to, to presentation is uh, an ongoing project. And I'll say it's a project that really is grounded in my own life as a, a black queer person in this country. Uh, it seeks to, it started off as a conference project, um, really taking up ideas that came out of my doctoral research that was led by Ronaldo Walcott, um, to think about what's happened to Black cultural producers since, since the inception of the Multicultural Act. What I saw in my research was that the 90s brought with it um, not only the implementation of the Multicultural Act, but with that came uh, an increase in the production activities of Black artists, curators, craftspeople across the country. Uh, the 2000s rolled around, the kind of diversity years, and at a certain point, there's been a retrenchment in the kinds of presentation activities by Black artists, curators, critics and crafts people. So my, my um, intent was to ask the question, what's happened? Where are we? And to make visible the fact that we are actually um, producing work. There are Black artists in our mix, black, black cultural producers in our midst, and at the same time as Black uh, folks, we know very little about them. So the, the State of Blackness from Production website, which you're looking at at the moment, um, started off as a repository for um, the information that came out of the State of Blackness Conference, which was held in 2014, I believe, uh, in which 42 artists, activists, uh, curators, critics, writers, students came together to problematize where we're at, both in um, gallery settings as well as educational institutions. 
uh, both of these two sites, I believe, are deeply implicated in, in what we come to know as culture. And hence, I thought the, it was very important that these two sites could come together to see the ways in which they're entangled in, in creating um, narratives about who we are, but also in terms of their responsibility for creating inclusive spaces that include um, the works of Black folks. So the website, as you see as I scroll down, there's a bit of information about the actual website. And I want to point out to you that the website also serves as a, a type of archive as to where we've come from and um, provides resources for educators, community folks, and a range of, of possible publics to engage with, with, with works of Black artists. The website is dedicated, and my work is dedicated to the memory and work of Ayana Black, who died in, 20, in 2009. Ayana Black, as, as I state here, was a fierce defender of Canadian culture and its production and dissemination, and she believed that we as Black Canadians have stories to tell about ourselves and relentlessly created spaces for us to do so. She was the co-founder of Canadian Black Artists in Action, Can Bahia. I also want to state that this work I'm doing is also trying to find um, new methods and methodologies for thinking through diaspora. And that work is really grounded on, on the works of artists, thinkers, and critics who've come before me. Um, activists, critics, and folks like Ayanna Black, Lillian Allen, M. Norbezi Phillip, Ronaldo Walcott, Stuart Hall, Bell Hooks, Paul Gilroy, Afua Cooper, Catherine McKittrick, artists such as Edward Bannister, curators such as um, David Wood, who's been working relentlessly on the East Coast to excavate and make visible the works of Black craft artists. Um, the work is also grounded in um, and celebrates the first um, Black feminist women's artist exhibition that toured the country that was originated at A-Space and um, organized by the Diasporic Artist Women's Women Artists Collective. These are the uh, folks who ground my work and in a way this dedication to Ayana also serves as a, a practice of citation to make sure that we honor those who've come before us. So the archive here, I'll go through it, holds a number of uh, events that came off of the, uh, came out of, sorry, the, the conference program. But I'd like to show you just a bit about the, um, the documents held here that were produced as part of the conference. What we have are, um, videos of uh, the, the uh, keynote, of, keynote address, as well as a YouTube channel that holds the panel discussions and speakers who, were, who participated. I'd just like to actually play a clip of um, Sylvia Hamilton's discussion, and I want to highlight Sylvia Hamilton in this discussion as well, because Sylvia Hamilton, I believe, is one of, in terms of the contemporary artists, a cultural producer who, have been, who has been slaving away relentlessly, I think that maybe might be the wrong term to use, forgive me, um, to make sure that the works and culture and the, um, the cultural manifestations of Black Canadians is remembered. And Andrea, we're not getting any volume. I'm sorry. Point. Sorry about that. I think I'm just going to skip forward on that until I figure out how to fix that. So what I'm going to, I'm sorry about that. I'd like to suggest that 
uh, you go to the website until I figure out this and um, click on the links there and you will get some information on the embodied um, engagement that took place as well as the works of several of the artists who participated in the conference. I'm going to skip ahead just not to take up too much time. Out of the conference came other projects which included, you know, uh, which included the development of a project called uh, Black Canadians at the sixth annual uh, Venice Biennale in which uh, some of us went as curators and critics to actually engage in developing uh, international diaspora networks as well as to make visible the work of artists, um, Canadian artists within, within the framework of that international festival. What you can find on that page are a number of articles written about our experience as well as a podcast that uh, was developed with the Fresh Arts International series. Another project that came out of, of, of the uh, State of Blackness conference was a research project with VTAPE, VTAPE uh, Video Distribution Center, International Video Media Arts Center here, that actually engaged with their, their uh, archives to pull out of their archive and database the works of Black Canadian artists in that database. And so this is the beginning of the first step of what will be a longer engagement with that space to make visible the works of Black Canadians in that database. Uh, and the latest project that has actually spun out of trying to develop international uh, global networks of diasporic cultural producers is a project that's called YGBI Young, Gifted and Black Italy, in which I um, collaborated with Black History Month Florence to lead a residency program that brought together young Black Italian artists to discuss uh, the notion of diaspora and create dialogues around the context of Italy, as well as the context of Canada. So there's also a resource page that I think for, serves as a very useful page for folks trying to find information and readings around Black Life in Canada. It uh, looks at, there's a long resource list here with a number of uh, resources. For example, um, a text, the latest book by Idil and Ronaldo called Post BLM and the Struggle for Freedom. Other resources include a piece by M. Norbezi Philip that was recently printed in Canadian art called Covidian Catastrophes. And as you can see, a very long and extensive list of other resources that are, are um, quite recent in terms of their uh, production. One of the most important things about this project is that it really serves, it, it is attempting to serve as a, a space in which we can actually find the works of artists, we can engage with them, the works in an embodied way. But more importantly, it's really trying to think through um, the ways in which as Black cultural producers and as Black, myself as a Black scholar and curator, the ways in which I can actually make uh, material, some of the ideas I'm thinking about in my work, the ways in which um, those ideas can actually uh, be translated into workable objects in other spaces. So within the classroom, within the space of the community, within the space of um, uh, research for curators as well. The project has now actually evolved into a project that seeks to um, not only collect, digitize, and centralize the, the works of uh, Black artists in the form of something called uh, the State of Blackness platform, which has evolved out of this idea from the State of Blackness database. So what the State of Blackness platform includes or comprises of two phases of the development of a centralized space. One, the collection and digitization, 
the development of works that exist. Also, the development of, uh, of discourse and discursive material that will actually reframe and reposition that work within the space of um, Black Canadian art. So meaning that um, we will write critical, critical uh, discourse to, to ground the works because up until now, the works have been seen primarily for their, their social impact as opposed for, to their artistic aesthetic and their input into the practices of curatorial artistic practice within this country. So the project seeks to reposition the works from those frames. The second part of the project seeks to ameliorate what a number of scholars are calling algorithmic injustice meaning that our works aren't found within within the digital space because the algorithms written to find them um, have within them the kind of bias that doesn't allow the machine the questions being asked of the machine to provide the the information that we as black producers are looking for so the project has become quite I would say ambitious, yet I think it's something that is really, really important to the work we do as Black producers if we want to continue to make ourselves visible, not just for the present, but for the future. Um, part of the problematics that's here in this country is that a number of institutions um, have not actually positioned the works of Black artists in their, in their collections, in their archives, or within the, um, the kind of critical discourse that they're developing around Black Canadian, around Canadian art. Hence, our works are buried within their, their um, archives if we're there. And if we're there, at times the work has not been categorized in ways that make sense to us who live, who live within the framework of Blackness. So I'd like to stop there and encourage folks to um really make use of this resource and um and again thank everyone and andrea for inviting me to present this work thank you so much andrea i'm going to next call on idil abdilahi to present she's an assistant professor in the school of disability studies an advisor to the Dean on Anti-Black Racism in the Faculty of Communication Services at Ryerson University. Her cutting edge research and scholarship on anti-Black Sanism have informed the current debates on fatal police shootings of Black mad-identified peoples. In 2017, her theorizing helped inform the inquest of Andrew Loku one among the many Black men killed by police services in the greater Toronto area. She is a co-author with Rinaldo Walcott of Black Life, Post BLM and the Struggle for Freedom, and author of the forthcoming book, Blackened Madness, Medicalization and Black Everyday Life in Canada. Idil, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, and uh, thank you to York University as well for having me. Um, I'm elated both to be among uh, very, very good friends and family members amongst the presenters today, um, but also among scholars and leaders um, and critical thinkers who have shaped and continue to shape my work. Um, and so I, I, I want to begin by beginning at the place where I've started to sort of think differently about some of the work that I was doing. And some of this thinking actually came by way of having read um, Ronaldo Walcott's, and I feel like we're all saying, we're all saying Ronaldo Walcott, but it's uh, in, very important. Um, Queer Returns, Essays on Multiculturalism, Diaspora and Black Studies. Um, and when this book first came out, I particularly remember reading this, and I'm gonna quote directly, um, from uh, Dr. Ronaldo Walcott. He writes, Black people died differently. He goes on to say, historical relations that produce Black peoples are the same relations that produce their deaths. Such claims mean that thinking Blackness requires we pay attention to how and 
to how and why Black people die, when and where we die. Black people die differently from others. And so this particular kind of theorizing um, and thinking asked me to think differently as um, a trained social worker, a clinician, a practitioner, someone who comes from a very particularized forensic background, um, working with people that are mad identified and living with mental health issues. And so earlier we talked a little bit about sort of um, in thinking about Black studies, the ways in which art, sciences, social sciences um, tend to be disconnected. And for me, particularly here in my experience within Black Canada, has really been that there's been no disciplinary uh, rigidity, given that in order to understand Black life and the context of Black studies um, and the work that I do in trying to understand that, there's been multiple influences in thinking through that. Um, I sat with the work certainly of Dr. Ronaldo Walcott, Christina Sharp, everyone on, on, on this call, the works of Saidia Hartman, um, the works of Dr. Pickens, who writes about um, Black and Madness, so forth. And so right now, my current work explores the difficult and uncomfortable yet necessary distinctions amongst Black people, that we exist both inside and outside the idea of collective trauma, particularly as Black people. I seek to explore this distinction uh, throughout, sorry, Hi, Adil. This is Emily Call uh, from the communications team, and I am so sorry to interrupt. We yep. do have a participant asking if you may be willing to turn on your video in order to allow for lip reading. Would you oh. be willing to consider that? There we are. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, can I start again? Absolutely. Thank you. I really appreciate it. No worries. Apologies for that. I should have been more thoughtful. <coughs> Um, so to continue, sorry, I'll just start over. So currently, um, I explore the difficult and uncomfortable uh, yet necessary distinctions amongst Black people. We exist both inside and outside the idea of collective trauma, particularly as Black people. I explore this distinction through the works of Moton, Pickin, Winter, Pickin, sorry, Winter, Hartman, Sharp, Fanon, and so forth. Um, to explain this difference between what I've defined as black psychiatrized madness. And so when I say this, I really want to be clear that I'm inviting us, specifically black us, to consider what is at stake for black people who are unable to traverse in and out of psychiatrized madness and its uh, associated, con uh, associated confining and often deadly capillaries. I also ask us to tend contend with the question posed by Walker, which asks us to think about um, which, sorry, reminds us that Black radicalism is animated by the question, what is wrong with Black folks? So I define Black in madness as an embodied experience of, various, of the various exchanges one has with the social world, both public and private, the manifestations of those interactions and the unnecessary responses in negotiating survival and livability of Black people. This includes and is not limited to acts of anti-Black madmaking and the maddening of Black people over centuries. This history, one of one, sorry, this history, um, this history, one of the modern world's making, is reinforced by the mundanity of black of the black and mad person situated in the colonial rational, rationalities of white supremacy, anti-black Satanism, and the deliberate dehumanization, con, de deliberate dehumanized configurations of the black person. Black life in this context is understood through the black and mad person, but not always the black psychiatrized mad person, thus making madness and being made mad ex um, existential to blackness and the experience of black life. And so what do I mean when I use the term psychiatrized, black psychiatrized mad? Um, and for me, it's sort of the ways that uh, it makes me think about uh, the people who are forced to interact with state institutions, which mark and categorize them as an undue threat. Such individuals are seen to represent a threat by being both black and categorically mad, as uncontainable and as untreatable outside of death. Further, in the context of blackness, understanding madness as a marker or signifier of blackness is connected to racializing discourses that uh, particularly and particularly anti-black practices and discourses. These ideological constructs frame Black existence and humanity not only as pathological, but as mad even outside of the medicalized, even outside of medicalized discourses. So to be clear, my definition isn't about creating a hierarchy um, 
of, of psychiatrized people. I'm not trying to produce a subcategory. My definition of black psychiatrized mad must not also be used for that purpose um, in order to create sort of a psychiatrized black neoliberal um, subject who sort of disabuses themselves from either race to get service or from, you know, from race in another way in terms of fitting into the dominant sort of mad discourses. Um, I try to think alongside and think or think about the ways that often psychiatrized mad black people are evicted from black communities um, and that they're not incorporated into often white supremacist mad communities. Um, their outsider status is fueled both by their condition and by the responses to their condition and their blackness. The psychiatrized mad Psychiatrized mad black people are contending with notions of untreatability and interminability in ways that those of us who are not psychiatrized but still may be mad are simply not. Black, um, black madness then is never just madness, but it is, psych it is psychiatrized, um, but in, sorry, but in the psychiatrized context, it is tied to the idea of danger, threat, and out of controlness. This dangerous ideology frames off, uh, this dangerous ideology ideological frame often results in the restriction of our bodily autonomies, the loss of civil liberties, and ultimately our death. Our everyday language and practices must become attentive to these dynamics so that, the, so that we have a fuller political imaginary that might frame our pol politics around trauma and make intelligible all Black lives with specific attention to mad Black lives and to psychiatrized mad Black lives. Um, and so just to sort of skip ahead, our, a lot. I'm just mindful of time. I also briefly want to pick up on um, what uh, Dr. Fotona had said earlier in really thinking about sort of algorithms and the ways that this, um, the ways that manifest in the context of Black people. Uh, so again, my work focuses on people who are part of my work for some people who are um, psychiatrized and killed by police services. And oftentimes what happens after that is that there is a um, SIU investigative process here in Ontario, um, which is a special investigations unit to determine the outcome of what occurred at that incident. Um, and after that, often, not always, there is how, uh, as well an inquest. And so some of my work is also beginning to think about um, the ways in which the inquest and the SIU processes function as an anti-Black technology um, and to really think about how uh, these kinds of practices end up reinscribing uh, blame towards the Black person. So when I think about the idea of uh, the inquest and particularly sort of this investigative process, particularly once there's been a loss of life, um, I sort of begin to think about that again alongside people like uh, um, uh, Noble, who really talks about algorithms and oppression, the work of Dr. Ruha Benjamin as well, who addresses these things um, also. So an anti-Black uh, technological autopsy is a dissection of data which is extracted from the Black body, used to reveal Black people often, used to reveal often what Black people know in order to refresh and reinscribe blame and the impossibility of innocence to the deceased Black person. And so I want to make really clear here that I, I, I make a distinction between the black body and the black person um because oftentimes what we know is that uh anyway i don't want to i just, let me finish reading um so the algorithm of this anti-black te technological autopsy is fixed guaranteeing the ongoing loss of black life um even in our death the intent of an inquest is not to assign is not to assign blame an inquest does not serve in this process the five central questions sought to be answered by an inquest are indicative of the problematic nature of this process black people are consistently being told that these interventions are for us and in some cases came by way of our own advocacy or our death. Um, so I ask us again to think about, for example, in the context of uh, the recent report by Dr. Um, the recent report by uh, the SIU regarding Regis Korchinski pocket, um, and to think about the amount of information that we were given, um, to think about the images that we had access to, the data that we had access to around the conversations that um, had happened that day in the home. If you read the documents, what you will realize is nowhere in there do we ever hear what any officer said. 
Nowhere in there is it documented sort of what the actual intervention was when police showed up there. Um, but what is highlighted is everything that Regis had said or what, we, what we're told Regis had said. Um, what is also highlighted is you sort of the 911 call. So when, I, when I'm speaking about this idea of innocence and reinscribing innocence, we often don't even have access to the full information that we require. Above and beyond that, thinking through what purpose, what would be the intent of having a picture of a Black woman who um, was falling to her death uh, and having that publicly accessible to us on the internet? What is the purpose of dissecting publicly this person um, is life in, in this particular kind of way? Um, and also, sort of, I'm going to really wrap up quickly. I think the other thing that I really want us to think about and to consider are what questions do we as Black people ask um, in these particular times? And so um, today, as sort of preparing for this, I thought a lot about once the um, SIU report had emerged, many, you know, I was looking online and many people were asking about particular parts of this whole human particular parts of the whole human that was Regis Korchinski pocket. And so when I talk about the ways in which um, we atomize people and, and, and cut people up um, in different kinds of ways, and the way that at times it is an auto discourse that we don't even create an interruption to that. And the last thing that I'm going to say is I want us to think about information. So um, I want to invoke, evoke the work of Dr. Christina Sharp, who talks about um, uh, annotation and redaction, Black redaction. And I thought about that specifically today. And in my work, I'm also thinking about that because when I compare um, the amount of redaction to the first ever released SIU report, which was the report of Andrew Loku, um, and the heavy redaction that was on that document. And what does, it, what does it mean now to have so much information, but not the right kind of information about this person? And so really think of, thinking about how anti-Blackness operates and what it is that we're being asked to think about and um, to consider. And so um, just to keep in mind that time and time again, that uh, these kinds of ideas are weaponized and re redeployed, they're um, redisguised and they're reanimated in the contemporary moment. And so when we get a bunch of information, like what we saw in the, in the SIU, um, just Korczynski SIU report, we have to be mindful about what we're seeing and the intent of that. What is that doing? What is the purpose of that? Um, and fundamentally, you know, an inquest functions um, as a means for the public often to vindicate whiteness, state violence, and the ways um, and the ways it stages the fatality of Black life in the in the final act culminate, culminating in the reassertion of white innocence in the face of anti-Black white irrationality made rational. Ultimately, an anti-Black technological autopsy of the black body in death is utilized as a mechanism to unincarcerate whiteness from accountability when it upholds the state's algorithm that naturalizes the murder of black psychiatrized mad people at the hands of police. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adele. Thank you. You've given us a lot to reflect on. I'm, I'm going to next ask Rinaldo to speak. Rinaldo Walcott is a professor in the Women and Gender Studies Institute at the University of Toronto and among the most important and widely published scholars in Black Canadian studies. He's the author of Black Like Who? Writing Black Canada, the first field defining text in Black Canadian studies. He's also the author of the forthcoming book, The Long Emancipation, Moving Towards Black Freedom, coming out of Duke University Press in April 2021. The Long Emancipation argues that Black people have yet to experience freedom and that being Black in the world is to exist in the time of emancipation in which Black people must constantly fashion alternate conceptions of freedom and reality. Rinaldo. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, York University um, staff, other faculty, and particularly the tech people for uh, hosting us today. 
This is kind of a, a little bit of a treat for me because all of my friends are speaking and this doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm almost, I don't think I've ever been on a panel with all of my friends. So this is, this has turned out to be a little bit of a treat. Um, I have a little narrative, so I'm going to get right to it. And the little narrative is called The Black Aquatic or the evolution of an intellectual project in a time of crisis. From where I sit, Black Studies is in crisis. Some of you might see me tweet from time to time different moments or symptoms that I identify as a part of the crisis. Today, by way of talking about my current interests, I hope I can say something about the nature of that crisis and hint at the opportunities it offers us. But first, let me briefly say something about how I arrive where I am right now. I've been doing Black study and Black studies and studying Black studies, the intellectual project, on the various monikers, cultural studies, Black Canadian studies, Black diaspora studies, Black diaspora cultural studies for a long time and with a particular focus on Black Canada. It is important to note in Canada because my entire development as a scholar occurred at two Canadian universities, York University and the University of Toronto. And neither had Black Studies programs or departments. So my orientation to Black study occurred outside the officially designated Black Studies programs and departments. And it occurred in a landscape where Black Studies was not a marked intellectual terrain. That is beyond individual scholars. It's important to note that it is not only that it is only recently that scholars specifically identified as doing Black Studies in the Canadian Academy have been an official marker. Indeed, my generation of scholars working at the intersections of the humanities and the social sciences and interested in Black Canada found our intellectual home among post-colonial studies and with the white Americanists in Canada. They had some sense of Blackness among them and the cultural studies folks. For a very long time, the Canadian Association of American Studies was where one had to go to engage scholarship on Canadian Blackness outside of history circles, and later the Canadian Association of Cultural Studies. Canadian Studies was and still remains vehemently anti-Black as an intellectual formation. It is in this current moment then that it's heartening to bear witness to programs and certificates being established in the Canadian Academy and to see tenure stream positions being advertised and filled in explicitly named Black Studies positions, given what its past in Canada has been. And even more so, it is powerful to see students desiring to do Black Study and Black Studies without immediately thinking they have to decamp to the USA, which has been a Black Canadian tradition. In short, the scene has entirely changed, and it also has not. For example, the folks who did anti-racism scholarship are now claiming to do anti-Black racism studies and even Black studies now. I still recall a former colleague chastising me for joining the Cultural Studies Research Center and not an anti-racism one as me having chosen the white people. Black studies in Canada was not fugitive. It had to be smuggled in. And I did so as a former Canada Research Chair by formulating a research program about, quote, the other Canadians, that is, all the not white people. At the moment, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, after 50 years of Black Studies founding, still does not have a category in its granting machinery for Black Studies. I see this as a significant anti-Black recalcitrant on Shirk's part, and it has an ongoing impact on how someone like myself engages, or rather does not engage with Shirk. Black studies still, by and large, has to be smuggled into Shirk's funding categories. So while Shirk funds Black study research, it does not officially recognize Black studies as an academic field. This is in brief the macro condition of where my work is located in the Canadian academic sphere. My current project, tentatively called the Black Aquatic, takes me to the sea, to the waters, back to the Middle Passage. This project takes me to the crisis of Black subjectivity and Black desire. 
After my dissertation work in the mid 1990s, I had embarked on two projects. One on the Middle Passage and its representation in literature, film and music. And a second project on Black Canadian cultural criticism, drawing on literature, film and music. I abandoned both projects despite having a fair bit of work accomplished on them. There are all kinds of reasons why the abandonment occurred, but my time would allow me to delve into them in any great detail today. Suffice to say that Black scholars are often pulled in so many different directions that a studied focus on a few selected areas is a gift we, often, we are often not easily afforded. And if we desire to make the academy a slightly better place than it was at the time we entered it, then the demands of that work diffuses our scholarly efforts too. In short, it has taken some time for me to find an intellectual rhythm in the Canadian context to do the sustained work on the kinds of things that are most important to me. When I read Sadia Hartman's Lose Your Mother, a journey along the Atlantic route, I was both instructed on the importance of the Middle Passage and immediately reminded of, my middle, of, of why the Middle Passage requires serious and sustained study in all its many manifestations. Of course, Hartman's autobiotheoretical account of the slave route is not only about the Middle Passage, but the text reminds us of the Middle Passage, reminds us of what the Middle Passage has wrought and why we ought to come to terms with it. Lose Your Mother has been, an has been an incitement for me to think the Middle Passage again. And it's through this project on the seas, on water, in the era of climate change, and a new extension of the Middle Passage, this time across the Mediterranean, that I have returned to my Middle Passage project, but obviously differently from the moment of the mid-1990s. The haunted life, as David Marriott would term it, of the seas, frame Black being still. The Black Aquatic seeks to make sense of how the sea produces the conditions for a Black subjectivity, bound by its past, but not irreducible to it either. If settler colonialism prioritizes the land, then Black diaspora analytics might turn to the water as a counterpoiesis to land as producing forms of known subjectivity. I'm instructed in this line of thinking by the work of the Caribbean intellectual Kamau Graphic whose articulation of the literature of catastrophe or, cult, or, or the culture of catastrophe as I rename it has more broadly orient, reoriented my intellectual concerns from one of mapping subjectivities to dwelling on how survivance becomes a part of a matrix of black invention and white supremacist structures and practices of subjection. The project is now further situated in what I call the crisis of black studies. The crisis has many elements, many twists and turns, and appears in a moment when Black studies as a particular form of study has assumed a kind of global presence. The many elements of the crisis are Afro-pessimism, Black optimism, Black liberal humanism, leftism and or progressivism, Black Marxism, Black communism, to name a few of the many different orientations that are currently being contested debated and dialogue in Black studies and Black studies. These elements are then met by or buttressed by various strategies like fugitivity, marinage, end of the, end of the world, reform, abolition, collectivism, all, are meant, all of which are meant as strategies of how to break the bonds of Black on freedom. These different strategies in their different articulations imagine a particular kind of black subject. And there is something we might call desire that is the foundation of their claims. A black desire often assumed and really theorized on the lies the crisis in black studies. This black desire is something we will have to grapple with. Claudia Tate in the mid 1990s already identified what she termed, and I quote, the residual surplus nature meaning of unconscious desire. Such desire, she writes, manifests itself in what I call implicit or unconscious discourses or narrative fragments of a text. They form an agnomatic presence that produces textual meaning, which in turn complicates the explicit social message of the text, end quote. While Tate keeps her, 
while Tate keeps her insights firmly rooted in the literary texts she studies, I believe her insights breach those texts and are useful for Black studies and Black study as a whole. The question of Black desire and Fanon's sociogeny alongside Sylvia Winter's extension of it, that is sociogeny, offers us the possibility of coming to some kind of meaning about what and how the subject of Black study and Black studies might be. In short, I am suggesting that the contemporary crisis of Black studies is a crisis of the subject and a desire to stabilize that subject that continues to evade us. This brings me to how Black studies, Black study, and how my studies of Black studies informs my work going forward. I turn to Stuart Hall's Cultural Studies and His Theoretical Legacies often as an essay that guides my intellectual work and as a signpost to refuse certain kinds of theoretical orthodoxies. In that essay, Hall reminds us that, and I quote, the only theory worth having is that which you have to fight off, not that which you speak with profound fluency, end quote. The Black Studies of my study then is a capacious and transgeographical configuration of thinkers, texts, geographies, and bodies of water. And, all, and this all refuses the national as an arrival designation. In this way, then, I'm less interested in theoretical paradigms set up to prove a position in advance of a thorough engagement. But rather, I'm invested in Hall's instruction that, quote, there is all the difference in the world between understanding the politics of intellectual work and substituting intellectual work for politics, end quote. There are sites of Black studies that would find my turn to Hall anathema because it appears to eschew political economy in favor of culture. But as a student of Cindy Winter's body of work, culture as actuality, to quote her, is the foundational claim of how I proceed. I'm therefore less interested and motivated by something shorthandedly called critical theory, as I am in the expansive possibilities of Black ontologies and subjectivities for which language seems to fail us, but for which an intellectual practice of politics demands we pursue. Indeed, I think this pursuit has been the political work of a vast number of Black diaspora intellectuals before us and still with us. The Black Aquatic as a project seeks to enter this intellectual territory. Indeed, the project is influenced by and, found, and based on the foundation of Kamal's graphic culture of catastrophe, which is a particular logic of Black life. Finally, at the core of this project is the problem of being or ontology, or put another way, what and who is the subject of Black studies? And it is in pursuing this concern of who is the subject, who is the subject of Black studies that the crisis of Black studies becomes more apparent. Does Black studies have an unconscious? Is it a collective unconscious? What is or might the narrative of that unconscious be? I turn or return to psycho to analysis is to think Black desire in complex ways, not as a foregone conclusion of Black subjection, but as something more complex and unknown in the midst of ongoing subjection. It is why I then turn to art across various genres to offer a kind of diagnosis of Black ontologies and Black desires as unruly, contingent, indeterminate, unknown even. But in doing so, I also fashion this inquiry through Hall's insistence that, quote, politics is impossible before what I have called the arbitrary closure, end quote. And the Sylvia Winters demand that, quote, what needs to be brought to an end is the entire history of these past 500 years, end quote. The Black Aquatic seeks to move this project that we might call conclusion along as a significant part of how to work towards freedom as a desire of the unachievable tales of our current crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronaldo. I'm now going to invite our final speaker. Christina Sharp is my colleague and a professor in the department. Ah! is my um, colleague and professor in the Department of Humanities at York University. She works in the areas of Black diaspora literature and theory, Black diaspora visual cultures, Black feminist theory, and Black queer studies. 
Her two books, Monstrous Intimacies, Making Post-Slavery Subjects, and In the Wake on Blackness and Being, have solidified her place as a leading thinker in her fields. In the Wake, in particular, has been vastly influential in broadening and deepening interdisciplinary understandings of diaspora. It was a finalist for the 2017 Hurston Wright Legacy Award in Nonfiction and was named one of the best books of 2016. She's working on a third monograph, Black Still Life. Christina, over to you. Hi, Andrea, thanks so much. Um, so first I wanna thank you, Andrea, for the invitation to participate um, in today's teach-in and for all of your work in organizing it. Um, I also want to thank you for your words from last week's scholars strike. Um, I returned to them and they were so powerful and they've stayed with me. I want to thank each of the other panelists who've spoken before me for their words, Kinesia, um, Andrea, Idil, Ronaldo. Thank you for your words and for your big, big work in the world. So my comments today are framed as a series of nine reflections and in listening to Kinesia read again, I realized conversations on texts and the work of words. Reflection one, there's time enough but none to spare. Charles Chestnut, the marrow of tradition. Something momentous is happening everywhere. In the wake of the police murder of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, and the many police murders of Black people since then, protests have continued all over the world. Their intensity and reach, spread and velocity have been a long time in the making. We are still experiencing, living in and with mass uprisings, mass refusals, mass imaginings, increased calls for abolition, increased enactments of abolition, which as Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Mariam Kaba reminded us just two nights ago, is both a tearing things down and a remaking. Abolition, says Gilmore, is more, more than anything else is presence. People everywhere are clearing a space into which something new is being summoned, something Black people imagine daily, something like breathing. For four months and in the midst of a global pandemic, the effects of which are disproportionately harming Black people. Hundreds of thousands of Black people have gone into and stayed in the streets where they face at least the triple threats of COVID-19, the violence of care, no care if infected, and the always present threat of police violence, police being already itself a name for violence. Yet they remain in the streets demanding an end to policing and all that it sustains and is sustained by it. They are manifesting that care is shared risk and that quote, abolition is a synonym for love. That's Sadia Hartman. They are refusing the unbearable life, rejecting the dead future. Reflection two. There's time enough but none to spare is the final sentence of The Marrow of Tradition, that barely historical novel that Charles Test Chestnut published in 1901, just three years after the events that are at the novel center. The Marrow of Tradition fictionalizes the 1898 Wilmington, North Carolina riot slash insurrection in which white militias murdered hundreds if not thousands of black people and drove out of the city all but three of the surviving black residents. This anti-black violence was centered in Wilmington, but there were orchestrated attacks that day throughout much of North Carolina. Chestnut's novel is filled with quotidian and extraordinary terrors, filled with white terror and white enjoyment of that terror, filled as well with the freedom dreams of black residents. The architects of the massacre, the Secret Nine in Wilmington and the Big Three in, in the Wellington of Chestnut's novel are outraged by Black breathing, Black freedom, Black laughter and Black participation. It seems to me that Marrow is a novel that is extremely relevant for our present time in the US and in this place called Canada. Both settler colonial nations built on genocide, slavery, and histories and presence of removal and driving out. The marrow of tradition in Chestnut's novel is white supremacy and virulent anti-blackness. 
the white insurrection is a violent response to real and perceived black prosperity after the residents of Wilmington elect a biracial fusion government in which, quote, there was a black justice of the peace, a black collector of customs, a black superintendent of streets, and an all black health board. Three of the 10 members of the local board of aldermen were African American, as were a significant number of local policemen, firemen, and postal workers. Among other things, Chestnuts is a novel that shows us that Black freedom has always been the problem. It shows us that Blackness, as Hartman writes in Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, was a status offense. Reflection three. In a map to the door of no return, Dion Brand writes that, quote, books leave gestures in the body, a certain way of moving, of turning, a certain way of closing the eyes, a way of leaving, hesitations, Books leave certain sounds, a certain pacing. Mostly they leave the elusive, which is all the story. They leave much more than the words, end quote. I've always looked to books, to poetry, fiction, nonfiction, theory, memoir, biography, mysteries, plays, to help me locate myself, to tether me, to help me make sense of the world, and then to act in it. I've said over and over, and I both know and believe this, that books saved me, by which I mean that books saved my life. They gave me a place to land in difficult times, and they showed me Black worlds of making and possibility. Reflection four. In Poetry is Not a Luxury, Audre Lorde writes that poetry is the skeleton architecture of our lives. It forms the quality of the light within which we predicate our hopes and dreams towards survival and change. First made into language, then into idea, then into more tangible action, end quote. We predicate our hopes and dreams. This semester I'm teaching Imagining Slavery and Freedom, and it's the third time I've taught it, and I'm teaching it both as an undergraduate and a graduate seminar. And when I first put the course together, I landed on imagining for a number of reasons, um, at, both because of what Lucille Clifton says, if you can't imagine it, you can't create it. Um, and it's at the center of the courses because I also wanted it to be clear that African chattel slavery, the abduction and torture of Africans, the brutal architectures of the Middle Passage, the coffle, the auction block, and more, involved the work of imagination, involved in fact the work of many imaginations in the service of brutality, in the service of capital. The second word freedom is because I know that our freedom or more precisely our liberation needs all of our beautiful imaginings to usher it into being. So this year, as I radically remade the class to try to attend to questions of data, to attend to questions of, of other forms of surveillance and policing, I tried to think about what books would be enough armor for our present times. Reflection five. The first books that we will read together are Frederick Douglass's The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, written by himself, and Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, written by herself. Douglas shows how a quote slave is made and unmade. Jacobs imagines freedom from that loophole of retreat, that three foot high, nine foot wide, seven foot long, cramped space. Minta in Fred Dagar's Feeding the Ghosts, after being thrown from the Zong, narrates a relationship with wood and rope and line, languages that come to her from her father, that connect her to her father, to whom she will, whom she will never see again. Minta crawls back onto the ship and recounts it in this way. Grain emerged from wood, plaited into a rope, and offered itself to me. And I gripped it and kept my hold on that grain. I climbed up the side of that ship, end quote. Each imagines something like freedom from within slavery. Reflection six. Afua Cooper begins her preface to the hanging of Angelique by walking in the streets of old Montreal. She writes of the brightness of the sky and the intensity of a heat that she notes that she has only before experienced in the Caribbean. Cooper is walking the streets that Marie-Joseph Angelique walked. As she begins there with her body in the places where Angelique was. She begins with the nearness of then to now. She begins with what Michel Rothtoyot calls the presence in the past. Reflection seven. 
There is a deep, long tradition of Black arts, ranging continents and archipelagos, attendant on the modern and its legacies of transatlantic slavery, colonialism, and racial capitalism. Black artists engaged in the knowledges produced by these legacies and contemporaneous tragedies across form and those without a form, those who, whose form were their lives, have always performed, thought, lived, and enacted a desire for freedom. They have always fought for and made spaces, imagined ways when there was no way. Every movement for Black liberation, every era of Black struggle has been accompanied by its singers, dancers, poets, storytellers, its musicians, its artists, its theorists of the possible world, its theorists of the imagined world. These are the tracks we work in, if we are lucky. Reflection eight on first sentences. What she liked was candy buttons and books and painted music, deep blue or delicate silver, and the west sky, so altering viewed from the steps of the back porch, and dandelions. I know that woman. Marie Ursul woke up this morning knowing what morning it was and that it might be her last. Are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? Upon his entrance into Texaco, the Christ was hit by a stone, an aggression that surprised no one. I was not sorry when my brother died. It seemed almost incidental that he was African. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. What I'd like to hear about, the reporter starts in, is the time that you and that little boy. And I silence him again with a turn of my head, thinking to myself that this is supposed to be an interview about the war and my service in it. From the day I enlisted, despite being almost a score years too old, having several mouths to feed, and running a tavern under my own name, a grasshopper's jump from the riverfront, to the day we were sent by wagon and train down to Brazos de Santiago, where we launched the fight that ended on that spring day ten years ago along the Rio Grande, on the meadows of Palmito Ranch, where we learned later from a scout we captured on the other side was the final battle in the Great War for our freedom, or between the states as they like to call it these days. So I ain't about to devote a minute to those sense-defying events of 40 years before. Mr. Blakey, the small white man asked, I had my recurring dream last night. It brought it all back to me. Reflection nine. This morning I read an article on how poetry helped survivors of Hurricane Katrina. The poet Mona Lisi Saloy says, quote, poetry is human history. Poetry is yes, intellectual. Yes, a report but it is imaginative. It is more than what's real. It's reality and reality multiplied and felt so deeply. We're not just authors. We are like the carriers of our culture, end quote. Other ways of living are not only possible, they're being written and made. Possibility and imagination are the engines of internal life for black people. They're mechanisms of black life. The work of words opening into possibility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And I'm going to ask the, the five speakers if they could um, on on they could um, reveal their their images. So start their videos and join me on on the screen. We're with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to to the participants, we have about 20 minutes for, for questions and we're happy to, to take these. If you have questions, you may send them to one of the hosts by using the, the chat feature. And I, I want to apologize to those participants who needed ASL interpretation. Um, we tried, we were only able to get one interpreter and, and it was too much to ask one person to do so we will 
ensure that in the future um, we we allow enough lead time to make that possible. I'm not seeing any questions in the in the chat yet. Um, maybe I might ask the speakers if anybody has any anything maybe that you wanted to to say that you felt you didn't have time for or or any ways in which um, you want to talk across your your work I would just like to to thank uh, my my co-panelists and the the moderator for um, I mean, I said it in my introduction, but for the really tremendous work that, that you all are doing. Um, the Andrea Fatina, the database, I can't wait to teach with it. Um, Idil Abdullahi, we need your book. Ronaldo, we need your book. Kinesia, um, I need your book of essays and your book of fiction that's coming out. So um, yeah, I just want to, want to thank each of you for the tremendous um, generative, expansive work that you, you all do. Um, and I know I'm teaching with, with all of you. Okay, I just received um, a, a note. Somebody just put up a note on their screen. Emily saying the chat is disabled. <laughs> is that correct? If they could take another look now, Andrea. Okay, can you try again, um, Abdurrahman? I'm seeing messages come in, although uh, I can also share the screen with an email address should anybody continue. Yes, I'm, to I'm getting issues. messages on my phone as well saying the chat is disabled. Mm -hmm. It's only private messages, so should mm -hmm. you can send your if you can send a message privately to me, then then please please do so. Yeah, and so I'll specify we won't be using um, the chat as some meetings use the chat to post questions where everybody can see them. Rather, we'll post uh, the questions and uh, Andrea will moderate and read out the questions and, and make some key connections for us as well as we go through. So please uh, do feel free to send your questions to myself. Uh, that's Emily Blythe or Andrea, that's Andrea Davis, and we will ensure that uh, they get read back out so that it is accessible to everybody to hear and see those questions as well, uh, and that they get answered and discussed. Okay. This is Andrea. I too just wanted to thank the panelists and to thank you, Andrea, and everyone involved for bringing together the speakers, Ronaldo says, friends actually. Um, folks who are doing work that intersect and that speak to each other um, into the space because we actually don't get this kind of opportunity very often and I really think it's the beginning of something that we must um, maintain and sustain um, keeping in the tradition of the ways in which Black intellectual thought has been developed and continues to develop. Thank you so much, Andrea. I, I absolutely agree. This was a wonderful opportunity and, and such a treasure, really. Okay, we have, we have a question from Denise. My question for the speakers is what advice do you have for those of us looking to practice decolonization within our lives? We discuss decolonization here in Canada very much when it comes to the indigenous people of this land, but what do you suggest for black folk wanting to practice decolonization? And, and there are a few more, maybe I'll just take a few together. So there's one that's for Idil coming from Kimberly. Can Idil Abdullahi speak more about the distinctions between the Black body and the Black person? I'll, I'll stop with those two. We'll start with those two. Okay. 
So Idil, you could start or we could start with a, the decolonization question. I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to, to start and then we can come back to the decolonizing question. Thank you, Kimberly, for your question. I really appreciate it. Um, so just to make the distinction in the context of the, my work um, is that oftentimes when we talk about the black body, I think that there's, there's, there's a missing sort of livability and life that is, that is missing in that. Um, and for me personally, and obviously other scholars as well, um, I'm certainly not the first person to say this again, to be really clear, um, but the way that I'm sort of holding it is when I think about this in the context of disability and madness and also blackness, not just um, black people living with disabilities or that are mad, but those ideas separately and together. Um, what we know is that people that are mad identified and people who are also living with disabilities of various kinds, irrespective of race, um, there are ways in which we don't understand these folks as humans in general, right? And further to that, um, I think that when we compound these ideas with blackness, what we already know is the non-humanness of black, of being black in the ways that Winter talks about it, in the ways that Hartman talks about it, in the ways that many scholars have talked about these ideas um, in the past and so when we merge when we merge this for me in my practice um it's important that i make that distinction because the people that i work with and the people who've taught me and the survivors and the um peers they're they are people that are living they're not just bodies they're not just vessels they're not a container they're not a shell um just to take from um Desmond Cole's book title, right? The skin that we are in. There's something, there is the skin that we're in and then there's the, the spirit that is in the skin. There's the being in the skin. Um, and these are things I think that are really important to hold. And we as black people, we need to defend our, our own humanity. And so when, for me, that distinction is remembering that people living with disabilities, mad identified people, black people are already dehumanized um, and are non-human. And so I want to assert that when there is death in the context of disability, death in the context of mental health, death in the context um, of madness, it's really, really important that we remember that we are still talking about people because the state is not talking about Regis Korchinski pocket as a human being, as a black woman, as a daughter. They're not talking about, you know, they weren't talking about Andrew Loku in that way. And so when we think about the idea like Christina talked about earlier, and also the work of Norbessi and other people that talk about defending the dead, I think it's important that our humanity and our personhood is a part of that. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I I, can, is it okay if I say something? Absolutely. Um, it's, really, it's, it's really in relation to something that Idil said earlier. I thought that your discussion of the, the question of the autopsy and the, the kind of, uh, and I'm not just saying this because you use my work, <laughs> but the, the question of redaction. That, that all that was redacted in the LOCU um, autopsy report, and then this sort of excess of information that has been given out about Regis Christian C. Paquette, um, I thought that was really interesting and that that tied into your question about the relation, to your answer about the relation between the black body and the black person um, and why it might be important to both speak about bodies but also to, to speak about people. Uh, I just want to thank you for that work and I really, I really look forward to, to reading it. Okay, thank you. I, I want to offer you a question from a graduate student, uh, Nadia Hussein. She says, I, I wanted to ask the presenters how they're finding energy to write in this climate. As a first year PhD student, I'm having trouble not feeling hopeless when I try to write. Yes, Ronaldo. You're muted. Okay. Um, I'll try to answer, say, answer the question about writing by saying something about decoloni decolonization. Um, I know that I've shared with Christina and Kinesia that in, in moments of crisis, in moments of crises, we're kind of all tasked with what can we bring? What do we bring to the table? What do we have to offer? Um, and so what some of us can do is read and write and share. And so I see that as a part of 
what we bring to the moment. So if, if that is what we're oriented to, that's what we can bring to the table. And I very much see that as a part of um, how we might think about some notion within the Canadian state, within the geographies and the boundaries of Canada for Black people in relationship to this question of decolonization. Now, I, however, want to be really cautious that these languages and logics of decolonization are really just updated multiculturalism. And that they, they're not, in my view, um, the, kind of a, the kind of decolonization that a Kamal Brathwaite, a Sylvia Winter, a Franz Fanon, an Amy Cesar is asking us to undertake, which is an entirely reorder of the societies that we currently live in. So this is why Winter says, what needs to be brought to an end is these last 500 years. Um, she's calling for a reorder. Um, and I call it a conclusion because I think where Winter differs in her asking for the last 500 years to be brought to an end, where she differs from others who argue for um, an end, bringing the world to an end, is radically different because Winter understands that at every closure, at every conclusion, is a new invention. So the task for those of us who do intellectual work in this moment of crisis is to begin to imagine what in the moment of conclusion what the what the invention might be what comes after that conclusion because it's not satisfactory to say uh, about it, it might be satisfactory for some but we all know that every ending is a new beginning mm. that's a kind of pragmatics of a certain kind of order of our lives so the energy comes from wanting to be a part of some kind of reinvention of what it means to be and of course in my book that's going to come out next year as a way of avoiding the debate around humanism I use the term life form um, of course life form comes directly out of Sylvia Winter's work as well and 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 so I, I think that you know this question of decolonization we have to be really cautious about it because decolonization and indigenization, as well as increasingly anti-Black racism as categories are being solidified in ways that are really simply an extension of um, Canadian multiculturalism. And we know that Canadian multiculturalism has put all of the concerns that Black people hold about how they can make their lives livable in suspension, if not in the deadly throes of, of the excesses of, of modern life. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rinaldo. Um, so I just wanna follow up on that in terms of decolonization, in terms of my work anyway, of realizing that as Rinaldo states, and I think as Christina stated, and other folks that it requires a particular um, imagination, a particular imagination of for what is to come, and not just the exchange of bodies and subjects into positions that already exist. I think we're in a moment in which the trap of, of exchanging bodies and not thinking about um, a new future, or futures actually, becomes the issue. And also the fact that this comes, this type of process comes in my mind with um, a level of deep contestation, a level of deep transformation and possibly violence as part of the process, something that we tend to want to within this kind of liberal and, and, and neoliberal space, want to move aside um, to actually put some sort of solve on the, on the, on the deep violence that it will take um, to actually shift to new systems. In terms of my own work, in terms of trying to uh, stay productive, um, I think a big part of it is also, as um, a number of writers have stated, is that you know some of this noise has to be shut off for me, 
and to focus on a space in which um, Euro-centered ways of thinking become decentered and new, and not so new actually, um, ways of um, understanding the world as to who we are as beings, both living and non-living beings and the relationship between that space, between the sentient and the non-sentient becomes really important as we move along to shift ourselves from spaces of, and ways of thinking that are predicated in deep extractivist um, paradigm. Thank you so much. Uh, I have if a I can add something. Uh, and I do have a question for you, Kenisha. Do you want me to read uh, your question first and then you can do them together? Sure, let's uh, see how that goes. I would love to hear more from Kinesia about the relationship between mourning and celebration, specifically as it relates to Acts 43 to 47 of living. And this is from Biko Gray. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll find a way to bridge, I suppose. Um, but I just wanted to extend uh, Christina, Ronaldo, and Andrea's rumination. I think this has a lot to do with what Edil was talking about also um, in relation to the black body and what it is probably to exist outside of the conscripts um, of trauma and collective trauma. Um, you know, I, I think in, in, in the closure that uh, Ronaldo referenced in, in, in terms of winter uh, that exists at the end uh, and, and basically is something suggesting an opening. Um, I would like to draw maybe a little bit of attention to the work of doubt in that. Um, and so how to avoid the pitfalls of uh, the certitudes mm. um, that in relation to definition, in relation to uh, a kind of ordering and organizing um, that might deaden the aliveness um, of what is being looked toward. And so I think doubt has a particular way of angling our thinking toward uh, really rich and generative things. Uh, and so we don't fall back into the same modes um, that would lead to things like policing, because even what uh, Ronaldo was saying um, just now about, you know, the fact that uh, decolonization and a lot of the language that's being used in that framework is a kind of multiculturalism 2.0. You know, it's it's the same kind of um, caution. I think about the work of language and how language is so deeply related to power and how that power then structures the way that we move through the world. Um, and so doubt, I would, I would say maybe hold on to that. Um, in terms of, of the relationship between mourning and celebration, uh, you know, that I think the two things coexist, particularly um, in relation to, 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 you know, existing in a world post transatlantic slavery. We're sort of born into all of these ceremonies of mourning, even if we don't know explicitly that that's what we're engaged in. And uh, the fact that we're existing in such an anti-Black world um, sort of predicates that we're, we're constantly surrounded uh, by occasions of mourning. And so I think celebration um, as a kind of counterpoint um, to the stuckness um, of, of mourning um, as, as, you know, as it relates to trauma, um, right, is something that, that I think my, my own practice of writing lets me put both hot and cold together, um, lets me put both mourning and celebration together um, as, as a way to say, no, you know, this is complex and we don't necessarily have to disavow the fact um, that we are mechanized in these mornings toward livingness, always angled toward aliveness and freedom and liberation. Um, and so that's kind of the way that I like to move through language. Okay. We, we have far more questions that then we... Can I just answer that too? Can I, I know it wasn't for me, but <laughs> can ahead. I say so? Go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, Biko asked the question and um, I know Biko has a, a really amazing book 
that is going to be with us soon. Um, but as Kinesia was talking, um, I wanted to say just one thing about decolonization was that too often decolonization projects, as Ronaldo and others have said, are both a kind of, you know, Canadian multiculturalism, but also reform. And we know that, you know, all kinds of, you know, terrible violences have put in, been put in place through the logic of reform rather than, you know, dismantling and, and imagining, right? I'm thinking about you know, abolitionist presence. The second thing is just the question, as, as Kinesia was talking, I started thinking about how my mother scripted certain things about her own funeral. And you know, she wrote me a little note and was like, Christina, you wear too much black, throw a purple scarf on, something, so that it's not just mourning, that you bring some color into, into, into it. And so thinking about the, the relationship, there's a difference between mourning and trauma. And, there's a, and, and for, for many of us, um, you know, these kinds of funereal celebrations are about the, the largeness of a life, even if that life, you know, hasn't actually had a chance to achieve that largeness. I mean, you know, I, one of my first lines was from jazz. You know, I know that woman. And it's about, you know, entering that, that, that funeral space. So thank you. I just want to say something really briefly about that, um, about trauma. One of the things I, in the 90s, I started working heavily with psychoanalysis and then I left it behind. And now as I go back to it, one of the things that I realize is really crucial, which is why Kamal Braffitt's notion of the cultural catastrophe is so important to me, is what happens when Black people replace this notion of trauma with the notion of catastrophe. What catastrophe does is it marks both the terribleness of the history, but it marks something that comes along with it, another kind or a different kind of outcome that to go back to the word that, that, that Kinesi news, a liveness, that in a way that trauma seems to deaden, concretize. And so one of the things that in this project that I'm going to try to do is, is to kind of think really hard and concretely about this notion of catastrophe as opposed to a notion of trauma. Because it seems to me that in some ways the language of trauma has ran its course for Black people. And I think Ido's work was getting at that in the sense of, you know, are we living a collective trauma as Black people? So then how do we talk about the specific trauma of the psychiatric, psychiatrized Black person? And so it's those kinds of things that I think are really, it, it's turning up something for me. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to close with one final question, which is a composite of two questions, and I'll ask each panelist just to respond briefly um, as their closing comments. Let me see if I can find them. So Saidia asks, and I'm going to twin her question with someone else's, can you speak more to the forms of freedom as aesthetic practice and imagining beyond the given. So can you speak more to the forms of freedom as aesthetic practice and imagining beyond the freedom? And I want to twin that to a question from KC. Uh, sorry, my apologies. KC wants, uh, KC, I will forward your question to Christina and Rinaldo separately. Okay, so this question is from Jamie Ryan. Jamie's wondering if the speakers would be comfortable with some specific novels, poems, artworks, or artists that have moved them lately. And Jamie says, I follow many of you on Twitter, and you often share such moving and beautiful works. So may I leave that with you as your final remarks? Do we want to go in the same order that we started, or whoever wants to go first? Same order, Christina? Same order, that way I get to go last. <laughs> okay, Kinesia, you're up. Um, forms of aesthetic practice and imagining beyond the given. You know, uh, I don't have, I don't have a compelling, um, a way to express what I think about this thing because I think for me a lot of what 
I do is really is is located in that in that impetus in that impetus to go beyond the given uh beyond the explicit um and i saw i, th I think i have an innate sense of aesthetic practice um and and that moves through different forms and different genres um but i think for me i, I love a sort of rich tapestry of different aesthetic engagements with with things. Um, and so moving between disciplines and between forms and between modes, um, I, I seem to have a particular form of, um, without, <laughs> without using, uh, uh, leaning too much on, on any kind of clinical language, I seem to have a particular form of ADHD that doesn't let me <laughs> sit in, in any one particular mode. You know, so I'm always moving through these various um, modes of aesthetic engagement. But I think for me, the things uh, that pull me into uh, an imagining um, that is capacious, uh, that has multiple doors, um, is always a seeking of beauty and not in any kind of, um, you know, simplistic, reductive Hollywood consumerism. Uh, it's it's really an engagement with the complicated, with the complex, and, and the very messy, you know. And that's I think why I was leaning toward doubt because it's always for me what draws me in um, is really the mode of question. What is the question? Um, and for me, there's always a sort of aesthetic pull toward that. How how is a thing expressed? It's not just what is expressed, but how how it's expressed, you know. Um, and so I, I think I, I live kind of spontaneously in that. Um, and so I don't, I don't really have a very compelling way to, to share what that is like. I think I just have uh, an innate sense of it. Um, uh, share some poems. I've been, I've been sitting very closely with Verso 6.3, uh, Beyond Brands, um, in the Blue Clerk uh, recently that has really been sustaining a lot of things for me, including that capacious imagining, you know, that I keep going back to the, what about the 900 petroglyphs of our embraces, you know, uh, in the face of everything that's happening. Uh, and so that line, that one line has done wonders and wonders for me. Thank you so much, Andrea. Andrea? Yes, so it's really hard to answer that question as well, but I think the work that draws me in most, particularly as I think about um, works that come from artists who identify with the Black diaspora, is works that are, are, are creolized in both form and content, um, works that bring together a number of what seems to be disparate aesthetics to form new, new aesthetics in the present. Um, I'm drawn deeply to works that engage um, the media arts and performance is one way of um, re-centering ideas around um, embodiment and the ability for certain subjects to speak in particular ways. Uh, lately I've become really, become really interested in abstraction, abstraction as a way to um, maybe create and imagine new ways to think about um, not only uh, those objects of, around us, but other ways to present and represent the body outside of that physical representation of the body. So I've become really interested and been doing a lot of research on um, uh, more emerging um, artists within the frame of abstraction. And the one person who's come to my attention lately that I think has an incredible amount of power to allow us to understand and work with the openness of, of art and the symbols of art is uh, a young um, Italian Black artist named Francis Offman. And his work takes up and tries to think through um, traumas uh, of the Rwandan conflict, but present that in a way that allows us to see um, the body, his body, humans as persisting and thriving through the use of really quite amazing colors and forms in, in the world. I mean, other artists, and I'm quite interested in, very interested in this notion of we must actually, as we think about 
aesthetic practice and forms of freedom that we actually also look at those um, artists white people like um, artist Lane, who's come much before this contemporary form, as I said, Edward Bannister, folks like that, to try to understand um, what we mean when we talk about Black aesthetic practices as well, and the complexity of those practices. I'm also really interested in a number of genres and uh, disciplines. So literature becomes something quite important. So the work of Dion Brand is quite important in my thinking through what it means to be here in this place called Canada. And not to mention that, although we work within the space of art production, that it is an interdisciplinary space and interdisciplinary engagement. So much of the works of the scholars on this panel comes to also form and also inform the works of a number of artists that I'm quite interested in as well. Thank you so much. Idil? Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to um, repeat much of what uh, Kinesia and Andrea said. They, they gave a really great explanation. I think the only, um, the only thing I think I would add is um, I'm really, um, I'm really interested in the work, um, the thinking, the art making, the art practices, um, of the disorganized, um, of the defiant, um, of the hidden. Um, I get a lot of my inspiration from um, the, what sort of many people would identify as the disorganized thinking um, of, of people. Um, and that is what gives me the capacity in many ways to feel a sense of um, organization in my thinking. Um, and a sense of sort of a radical imagination to be able to do something different um, mm -hmm. with a kind of way of thinking that may not be very common um, or not even common, a way of thinking that is quite shunned and, um, and is often seen as, as um, terrorizing other people. So I, I think I like to really think alongside and hold um, the, the beauty of um, what what it is that uh, we don't want to make space for. Uh, so I'm interested in that. Um, I'm also particularly interested in, um, in, like in terms of like the reading question, what am I reading right now? What's, um, so on my table right now is Raw, um, a book that is written, um, edited by one of my colleagues at Ryerson, Ricky Vargas. Um, and I would encourage people to read Ricky's work. Um, right now, uh, in terms of like dis critical disability work, um, work around race and queerness and all kinds of amazing things. I would really encourage people to look at that. Um, I continue to read the work of um, my colleagues on here. I continue to read um, the works of, um, you know, many other uh, Black Canadians specifically. Um, for me, it's also really important in many ways to continue to um, remember that quote, something happens here. And I do that by revisiting Canadian text. Um, I, I do that by, of course, the work of Dion Brand, the work of um, many other um, Black Canadians. Um, and then I think, um, like another, like I guess the last aesthetic, well, no, I'll leave it there, thanks. Um, Rinaldo? Yeah, um, I think the, this question of freedom is, is one that I actually that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And, you know, uh, my, my, my earliest formulations was to think about freedom as ahead of us, um, as yet to come, very much influenced by obviously the, 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 the Rida and the Ridian language. In, in my in my in my reading over the last little while, I, I'm 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 holding on to that, but thinking about also reformulating freedom as a kind of practice of the unknown, and as I think about the uh, unruliness, the indeterminacy of a certain kind of a black desire and a black unconscious, I'm also thinking about the ways in which that then expresses itself. So 
if a bit of me is a social scientist, I start seeing that as I kind of discuss a little bit in the long emancipation in the way in which, you know, um, black men wear their clothes, that there are these moments, these fleeting moments of freedom that black people have, but because we live inside a catastrophe, those moments are also very quickly usurped. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in our music, in our language, the way in which we take language and reorder it, um, the way in which we can take a, 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 a piece of clothing and, and, and reshape it in, in ways that were, until it occurred, not imaginable. Uh, but going back to the earlier conversation, when Christina invoked what her mom said to her about wearing some color, the way in which we even celebrate and mourn, mm -hmm. that what we do is to, to borrow again, since Tony Morrison has been invoked, um, that what we do is we practice a form of freedom that is an aesthetic, an aesthetic of acting out of the ordinary. And this acting out of the ordinary um, is also a site that is in some way so radical that it has to be colonized mm -hmm. and that it's often colonized through capital. Mm -hmm. So all of the kinds of examples that I can give you out of the kind of social world um, will be quickly contested because the, the, best, the best of our acts of acting out of the ordinary are quickly um, monetized, colonized, and sold. But that's not to say that in living in this catastrophe, that to survive, to survive is actually an aesthetic practice of freedom mm -hmm. in how we carry ourselves, in how we're able to communicate. And that communication happens not just within language, but in attitude, in stance, in a wide range of ways. So I think freedom then for us is very much like desire, which is why I have felt this urgent need to return to psychoanalysis. Freedom is then very much like desire. It is somehow unachievable, but we notice it. We know what it might mean for us. And, and we try to dwell there for as long as it is possible to dwell there. And yet then, as they would say, another eruption of funk happens. Thank well, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, people have said, you know, so much already. I mean, of course, you know, Wayward Lives is an example of, you know, a sort of deep consideration of those very forms of aesthetic practice. Um, and Ronaldo ended with the eruptions of funk, which is in the bluest eye. And of course, uh, Pauline wants to, those, 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 those particular black women want to dampen those eruptions, but it's those eruptions that, that, that are those kinds of aesthetic practices, you know, again, from Saidea quoting um, Du Bois, those aesthetical Negroes. Um, but I'm also thinking of those, uh, what are they called, the, the Sepo in the Congo? These ways in which people, you know, um, uh, adorn themselves um, all across the world, Black folks, right? Um, um, then I was thinking about works. I'm a rereader. Um, I get stuck in, but also because I, I learn from things again and again. So, you know, Kinesia, the dysgraph, this. Um, always Dion Brand, um, uh, Julianne Okotbitek, Otonia Okotbitek, um, Asiya Wadud. I've been uh, sitting a lot with Syncope, um, and I'm going to get, you know, the, the, the work that Syncope does. Um, I just recently wrote a piece um, for Jennifer Parker, Jennifer Packer, and I, I've been sitting a lot with her work. She's a, a painter and thinking about um, her uses of color, the kind of intimacy and care with which she deal, with which she paints her subjects. Torquase Dyson, writers, Kigoro Masharia. Um, I learn a lot from Kigoro and questions of experimentation. Um, you know, Alison Saar's work. Um, I learned so much from Saidia's work. Um, the rest of you on this panel, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And, and there, many more questions that we we haven't had time to get to but emily has assured me that that i'll be able to get a transcript of all of the questions and so i will try as best as i can to to collate answers and and i don't know if there's a way through registration to then get back to people with some questions or or to have um maybe a a a, a short um, response added to 
to the video that will be posted. I just want to thank everyone. I wanted to, to send us off with actually something from one of the presenters that I think segues very well from, from the, present, the presenter's um, final words. And this comes from Julian Okot Bitek says, grateful for this conversation, wanting to offer the words of Keguro Macharia to all of you on the panel, and I'm offering it now to all of us um, by way of a blessing forward. And it is a question that I, we won't answer now, but that what we will carry with us, and it is, how will you practice freedom today? Thank you so much. Idil, Andrea, Christina, Canicia, Rinaldo, for sharing this panel, for coming because I asked. I am so grateful. Thank because you. you asked. <laughs> clear, Andrea, because you asked. And, <laughs> and you're amazing. And thank mm -hmm. you, Andrea, for all the work that you've done. To Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, friends. I look forward to seeing you thank all you. in person. And thank you to the <laughs> 197 you. people left online. We appreciate you thank too. You. Be, thank you. Yes. So yes. All the Thanks, everyone. To the communications team, to Angie Lang for close captioning. And we promise that we will do better with ASL interpretation the next time. There will be many, many more conversations over this year and continuing on. And I look forward to the rich, rich work that is going to be produced by this group and by others. Good luck, walk well, walk safely. How will you practice freedom today? Love you all, peace. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care.